Hello! Lunachick here, and I'm highly disgruntled. Being that I was born in the late 80s, I grew up in the 1990s. And if you ask me, that's a perfect time to grow up because Disney was at its best in years. That's not to say that they didn't experience a slew of failures or just plain bad decisions. See, with every box office hit or mild success, we got direct-to-video sequels that were absolute crap in your little brother's pants. I'll talk about two during sequel month as soon as I figure out when sequel month is, this direct-to-video sequel, however, is a holiday sequel. I love Beauty and the Beast very, very much. It's absolutely magical, and the opening sequence still leaves me breathless to this day. The animation, the music, the story, the character development... It's all exquisitely done. Even the CGI is superb. And I'm pretty sure by now you know how I feel about Disney using CGI. The Enchanted Christmas suffers the problem that pretty much all Disney sequels suffer. Lack of passion or effort put into the making of the film. No care, no real thoughts. The writing is atrocious. The animation is okay, but at times a bit awkward. The songs are just awful and incredibly insulting when you consider the fact that the soundtrack to the original film was Academy and Grammy Award winning. Oh, and character development? What's that? We begin at Christmas time, after the spell has been broken, and we see our old favorites, Chip, Cogsworth, Lemire, Mrs. Potts! Hogsworth and Lemire argue... Well, I suppose I... I did manage to save Christmas. You? Yes, me. <laughs> if not for my skillful and decisive leadership, all would have been lost. Leadership? Ha! Ah, you could not lead a horse to water. It was all my idea. Your idea? Everyone knows it was mine. Mrs. Potts is entrusted to regale the story, even though everyone in the room knows what happened, because they were all there. Begging to question why start here in the first place. We're taking back to a year prior, after Beast saved Belle from the wolf she encountered when she tried to run away, but before they became friends. The gang are still trying to hook up Belle and the Beast. Voila! There he is! Wonderful! Hi, Belle! Oh, hello! Do you know what day it is? Today is December 24th. This is the main problem I have with the film. In the original movie, there is no indication whatsoever that it was even December. I mean, it snows in January too, you know. Also, if you really pay attention to the, the way the original film plays out, the events that occur take place over a course of a couple of days. Where in the hell did they have time for all of this to happen? Unless, of course, you do what this film did and overlap events. So they decide to coax Belle into ice skating, where Beast is, of course. Oh, good morning. Huh? <laughs> oh, dear. Are you all right? Uh, I fell and I landed on my... On, on the ice. It's pretty slippery. Yes, it's 
Slippery. Oh, good lord. The dialogue has truly suffered greatly. And then we meet our token bad guy. An organ. Chained to the wall. Played by... <laughs> Five. You approve? <laughs> Tim Curry. <laughs> Why, Tim? <laughs> this is even worse than Hexus. And I actually enjoy Fern Gully for whatever reason that I can't quite pinpoint. And let me tell you something. You'll be begging for toxic love when you hear his villain song in this film. Oh yeah. Slime beneath me. Mm. Slime up above. <laughs> Would you look at his character? It is blatant CGI. This is tragic when you look at the CGI used in the 1991 film. The one prepared, And I've never really thought about this until now, but where's the logic in the objects these people were turned into? Beast makes sense, but Lumiere, Cogsworth, the dog is turned into a footrest? I mean, there was a cat that was turned into a pillow, but the cat was only seen in the musical number Human Again, which was cut out of the original film for time. But unlike the musical number they cut from Lion King, This is the morning report, it's through the long and the short, it's every grunt, roar and snort. Human again is quite profound. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes. And a teapot named Mrs. Potts. How charmingly unoriginal. It gets better in this installment. We have a guy who plays a fife who's turned into a fife, and he's played by none other than Pee Wee Herman. Ah. Angeline, a tree topper, who was once the castle decorator, so she was transformed into a Christmas ornament. And she is voiced by the divine Bernadette Peters. You mean was the castle decorator. I am not responsible for this baroque atrocity. Why? Why would you do such a thing? And then there's all her little ornament friends. This is where I begin to question the logic behind a transformation. What happened to the regular Christmas decorations? The ones used prior to the transformation? Same with the dishes, or... Are we to assume that the Enchantress just decided to enchant everything? Except for select pieces of furniture, of course. Ugh, just don't think about it, Lizzie. Just don't. Anyways, Tim Curry's character, Maestro Forte, doesn't want Belle to break the spell because The master needs my melodies to feed his tormented soul. Whereas before, he wasn't needed, so he instructs Fife to sabotage any chances of the Beast and Belle falling for each other. See to it that this blossoming love withers on the vine. This is just ridiculous. You can't stop love. It isn't a physical force like a train or something. It's an emotion. If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. Yet somehow Fife manages to succeed in his attempts, which is rather miraculous if you ask me. Oh, and if you're wondering what his motive is, Solo for five in B flat. Oh, I'd do anything for a solo. That's right. He's trying to rip two people apart for a solo. I mean, I know the music industry is intense, but jeez. 
I mean, never mind that he's listening to a guy who's bolted to the wall. Therefore, isn't that threatening? This is no angel. It's the shadow of a monster. I didn't know the beast's name was Edward. You're beautiful. Beautiful. This is the skin of a killer, Bill. And as quickly as he morphs into emo Edward from Twilight, he morphs into both the Grinch and Scrooge moments later. I hate Christmas. And I hate the makers of this abomination. For whatever reason, Bell decides to reward Beast for his amazing douchebaggery, and we the viewers are tormented by a horrible song that makes me want to slip my wrist when I think about the incredible music from the first film. Magic world where the impossible becomes the everyday. We'll find a mountain top and the moonbeams to sit under. We will slay the dragons that still follow him around. Each every day, he'll find a better world and the strength. Hey, the book is backwards. Belle goes to Cogsworth to talk him into throwing a Christmas party. I never understood why Cogsworth was the one who's in charge. Clearly, no one listens to him. Absolutely not. Why not? Out of the question. Wine glass is whining. How? Incredibly clever. Even though Beast forbids celebrating Christmas, they all decide to go and do it anyway. Has anyone even told Belle at this point why Beast hates Christmas? It won't change anything. I believe it will. There is more. Yay! Another song that insults the integrity of the music from the first film and violently rapes my eardrums with its corny, lame-ass lyrics. As long as there's Christmas, I truly believe that hope is the greatest of the gifts we'll receive. As long as there's Christmas, we'll all be just fine. Beast finds out about Belle's plan, because Fife told Forte, and Forte told Beast. The day my life ended. Bring me my presents! And here we get a flashback. Within a flashback? I time out! How does Mrs. Potts, whom is the one who's telling this story, Know what was said between Forte and the Beast, or even Forte and Fife, for that matter. I hope you have something better for me, Forte. Yes, sir. Um, a f Jesus! That's the kind of thing nightmares are made of. We know the story of how Beast and the castle became transformed. It's Belle that doesn't know. And thank you for completely destroying what... I think was a really unique and creative way to tell a backstory. By using the stained glass to tell the backstory, you kept the fairy tale storybook feel without using the old opening a storybook trick. But actually having the characters talking and reenacting, as well as changing the hag slash enchantress's appearance, it completely abolishes the whimsical fairy tale feeling. Was it your intent to shit on your own masterpiece? Down at the boiler room, Belle looks for a Yule log. Story concrete! My head, don't worry, it'll pass. So, make up your mind already? Oh good. A Jewish axe. That's just what this Christmas movie was missing. It's a, a Yule log. It's a wonderful tradition. One log is chosen, and everyone in the house touches it and makes a Christmas wish. I'm so glad my family didn't partake in this tradition. The way it's portrayed here makes it sound incredibly stupid. 
witches are stupid. And so are my lines in this movie. You made a Christmas wish last year. Is this what you wish for? Oh, yes. And to be locked up in a dungeon fighting off pneumonia as well. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Amidst his asshole behavior that just adds insult to injury by reminding all of us, including himself it would seem, that Belle is actually his prisoner. You cannot possibly understand. You have no idea what it's like to lose everything, to be trapped in your own castle, to be a, uh, a prisoner. Is it just me, or has this woman's personality completely shifted? She went from strong, a dreamer, but no nonsense, to a bland pushover who dreams of fixing the beast. Well, girls do love the bad boys, so we can tame their wild, reckless ways. Ellen and Chip decide, fuck the beast and his bitter unhappiness. We'll celebrate Christmas anyway. Granted, you can't forbid Christmas itself, but you can forbid the celebration of it. And need I remind you, Belle, you are a prisoner in his castle. Regardless of Beast being a beast of an asshole, see what I did there? Deal with it, people. It's about as funny as the jokes in this movie. Do you know what day it is? Well, it's not Tuesday. Ah uh ha -huh, ha, uh ha -huh, ha. I want to kill myself. No, not big enough. In spite of Beast's grotesque behavior, Belle still gives him the presents she made him, and then searches castle grounds for a tree, which is odd that the castle, once adjacent to the woods, is now on what looks like a hilltop. Sorry, kid. I got a new master now. Ah, uh, that explains it then. Not only is the Beast a major asshole, but he's also completely oblivious, but then again, what guy isn't? Oh, shut up, you know it's true. What is that? Ooh, it looks like a Christmas present. It's for you, Master. It's from a girl. Mrs. Potts? Ha ha ha, so funny. Ha ha ha. No words. Too stupid. Beast feels guilty that he has nothing to give Belle, so he commands Forte to write Belle a song. This displeases Forte because the idea of writing cheerful music is just... perverse. Being the ultimate evil villain that he is, he lures Belle to him. What is that? It's beautiful. By playing loudly on his keyboard, which is technically his body, so wouldn't that mean that he was? Oh, mama! Oh, mama! Oh, mama! I'm so sorry, Mr. Ventura. Oh, uh, never mind. It's strange that she never noticed him playing loudly before. Of course, being the dimwit she suddenly become, she follows the eerie and ominous music. What's the matter, Sultan? The dog's name is Sultan. What? What is that? Oh, that music. Forte convinces Belle to go to the Black Forest to find the perfect Christmas tree. That's right. The woman who once could think for herself is coerced by a giant organ bolted to the wall to go to a forest aptly named the Black Forest, and even though she knows she gave her word not to leave castle grounds, as well as the fact that it's incredibly dangerous, she goes anyway. That's it. This bell, and this bell, aren't even remotely the same person. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. Nope. I want you to follow her. Make sure they don't come back. Cogsworth is sent to find Belle so she can hear the song that was made for her. Lumiere joins him and they discover that she's gone to the Black Forest. Mrs. Potts informs Beast they're having trouble locating Belle 
And so Beast uses the magic mirror. Magic mirror on the wall. Oh, no, no, not that one. He uses his magic mirror to find Belle. Show me the girl. And we're treated to yet another horrific song. Don't talk for hours, don't send flowers, don't write poems, don't sing songs, and dance beneath the stars that shine above. Don't fall in love. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> Doesn't it make you pine for toxic love? I know it does for me! Beast flips out, and by that I mean he literally flips a table over in the hall. Five scares the leap, which of course breaks the ice. Beast saves Belle from his usual cheerful disposition and merrily throws her in the dungeon. You broke your word, and for that, you will rot in this dungeon forever. Completely overlooking that ugly virus known as Monia. Ho ho ho! Doesn't this just fill you with Christmas cheer? Quiet, <laughs> you! What's it even talking to you anyways? I should have known you'd never be anything but a beast. Where does this fit into the original story? This goes against it almost entirely. Bernadette cheers Bell up. Your words lifted my spirit high. Oh, how dare you lend your gorgeous voice to this monstrosity. For shame. Being that it is now Christmas Day, Beast opens the gift from Bell and reads it. He knew someone cared. Christmas that year was spent exchanging humble gifts. But the greatest gift that anyone received was the gift of hope. Well read, and yet she isn't much of an author, is she? I think she's been taking too many notes from Stephen Meyer. We get the final song in the movie. You know how to get me stressed, but when it comes to making Christmas special... Uh, I'm a cut above the rest. If you could see things clearly, you would say that I've been blessed. You can't hold a candle to my time. Ah, I'm a cut above the rest. Wow. Doesn't it sound like they went above and beyond Be Our Guest? Ugh! It's horrible! It makes me feel dirty and violated after being moved. By her mediocre writing skills, Beast apologizes. Can you forgive me? Ish. To Belle. And she forgives him. Of course. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Let's give Belle the Christmas she's always wanted. Telepathically sensing that there's happiness being felt somewhere in the castle, Forte throws the biggest tantrum I've ever seen. What do you think you're doing? Don't you see? I... They can't fall in love if they have dead! A tad dark for a children's Christmas movie, don't you think? All this for a solo, Fife. Is it really worth it? Beast breaks the keyboard, thus killing Forte, I guess. Wonderful. No, no, no! You're overlapping events and just confusing the story. And they all live happily ever after, except the ones that actually love the original film. Those of us are brutally insulted by this enormous catastrophe and left feeling ass raped by the filmmakers. I feel unclean. <laughs> See you next time. Happy holidays. Rocking around the Christmas tree out the Christmas party house.